Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Hi. Right. Um, so today's class, I'm going to try to get as much as I can into uh, today's lecture. It might spill over in a little bit into uh, next class, but this is it. We've been talking about this for a long time. We're finally going to get into to, to discussing how we actually want to build the query optimizer, which is the arguably the most important part of a data management system. Every year I debate whether to even bother teaching 721 and just teach a topics course on, on query optimization. Um, admittedly, this is the part of databases that I know the least about. For people that are actually working on the Query Optimizer here, uh, the new project, you, at this point, you guys probably know more than I do. Um, but this is, this, this is the hardest piece, because obviously like, we can build the fastest engine, but if our query plans are, are terrible, then it's all, it's all wasted. You OK? OK, all right. <laughs> all right, so um, just refresh your last class, we were talking about uh, networking protocols. Um, and again, the, the, the main takeaway from this w discussion was, it looks and smells a lot like when we talked about storage on disk. Uh, you know, if we have a, uh, if our application is going to run queries that really care about a small number of tuples, then a row-oriented API or net network protocol that's going over a row-oriented or sort of row-oriented API or row-oriented network protocol that's being accessed through a row-oriented API like ODBC or JDBC, that's going to be sufficient. But when we start doing queries that want to get a lot of data out of the data system or doing bulk export then we want to use something that looks uh, that, that's, that's columnar, take advantage of all the other things we talked about before. And as I said, the, the Arrow database connectivity library is one to facilitate that. And I think that's the future of OLAP systems are all going to support this uh, if, they, if they don't already. And so as I said already, the next two weeks is really going to talk about query optimization. So today's class and next class will be talking about how actually you want to implement the optimizer itself uh, at a high level, like how you're going to define the rules, how do you then do the search to, to figure out you know, what transformations you want to apply to optimize things. We'll talk a little bit about query, query rewriting and obviously plain iteration is part of this. Cost models we'll discuss more next week. Uh, next class will be, sorry, next week we'll then talk about, sorry, next class will be further into the, the dynamic programming approach that's used by Hyper and Umbra from the Germans. Um, and then on Monday next week, we'll talk about doing adaptive query optimization, like the query runs for a bit, and you make decisions on the fly whether to change things. And then that'll feed into the cost model discussion in next week. So the next two weeks is getting purely on, uh, on query optimization, because again, it's, it's super important. So what do we care about in, in the scope? So this is, this is obviously a refresher from the intro class, but the goal of the DB Systems Query Optimizer, sometimes called the Query Planner, sometimes called the Query Compiler, if you're, if you're an older system or an old person, Right, because that, that's a remnant of the 19, early 1970s when the relational model came along. Right? The idea of taking a high-level language like SQL and, and converting it into a low-level, not assembly, but execution instructions to run the query. Like, they saw that being akin to writing a high-level language like C, because C was considered high, super high-level back in the day, and converting that into a low-level assembly or machine code. So, right, so the idea of the query optimizer is that we want to generate a, uh, for a given query, we want to generate a, a, a correct physical plan that will execute that query, ideally with the lowest cost. And I'm underlying the, the word correct here because obviously it doesn't matter if we have this super fast query plan, if it does not actually produce the result that we want, then it's, you know, it, then it's useless. For that one, we can, we, we can ignore approximate query processing stuff. Um, right? We really want a, an exact match for a given SQL query, we want to produce the, the exact output. And the cost is in quotes because, as we'll see next week, this is going to be a relative term that's going to, that's going to change depending on, a, on, on the system itself that's actually implementing this. Right? So the cost is going to be some internal metric that we can use to compare one plan to another and decide this one's better than another uh, based on the number of tuples read or CPU uh, instructions used or network tra traffic. Right? Again, that's going to change from, from one system to the next. And typically, this cost is not usually mapped to something in the real world, like, like runtime. Some of the enterprise systems, I, I know DB2 can do this, where they'll actually spit out, this query is expected to run this long. Um, but here, look at like Postgres's output of explain analyze, uh, or SQLite, or other systems. It's always going to be some number that does, that's, that's meaningless uh, outside of that system. 
So the, and as I said before, this is going to be the hardest part of the system. Just picking the join order is proven to be, I think, MP hard. But the whole, the whole problem of figuring out what's the optimal query plan is, is MP complete. Um, and so that means that despite the name optimizer, we're never, almost never going to really find the true optimal plan. Right? If it's something really stupid, like select one, semicolon, right? That one, actually, that, that usually doesn't even get past the optimizer. Like some systems will recognize that and immediately just send you back the result. It doesn't even execute it. Like they, they'll short circuit it. Um, but for, for things like looking up on a single index on one table, like, yeah, that'll be optimal because we know how to find exactly what we want. But once we start adding joins, uh, that's when uh, th things get really tricky. And so because we can't find the, we're now, we, we can't do an exhaustive search to find an optimal plan, we're going to have to use a bunch of uh, methods to, to, to trim down the number of choices we'd have to consider and try to guide the optimizer towards a, uh, a good plan. Right, because we can't we can't prove that it's going to be optimal, and then because it would be too expensive to, for all these possible choices we could have to actually run them to see whether they you know what their cost actually is, this is where the cost model is going to help us speed things up. But it's going to be an estimation of what we think the, the 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 system is actually going to do when it encounters real data that that you're targeting. So this is going to be super super hard, uh, and I'll try to sort of break it down and walk through the different approaches. Uh, that were discussed in the paper you guys uh, were assigned. Um, and the old joke for query optimization is like, if, say you want to be a rocket scientist, sorry, the other way around. If you want to be a, work on query optimizers and you can't hack it and it doesn't work out, then the backup plan could be rocket science because query optimization is considered harder than rocket science. Of course, you know, databases don't blow things up in the air, so maybe <laughs> that's debatable. Okay. So the, the important thing to understand SO2 is the distinction between the logical plan and the physical plan. Um, and the terms are going to be uh, sometimes conflated in the earlier optimizer implementations we're going to see because they may not even have logical plans. They'll go immediately from like a SQL query into uh, physical op plans. But the Cascades approach and the stratified search from Starburst that we'll see uh, in a second, they'll have a clean, clean distinction between the logical and the physical plan. And so the idea of uh, the logical plan is the, it's the high level operators we want, we want to execute for a query uh, based on something that looks like relational algebra. Like I want to scan this table. I want to join these two tables. But it's not specifying what actual algorithm you want to use to execute those different operators. So the optimizer is going to take a, a, the parse tree from the, from, the, from the SQL query that shows up do some transformation to convert that into logical plans that represent what that, that SQL query was trying to do. And then now uh, it can do further optimizations or further transformations of those logical plans into new logical plans. Or it can convert the logical plans into uh, physical operators, a physical plan that will define how we actually want to execute things. And this physical plan can oftentimes will depend on what the data actually looks like on disk. Do we expect things to be sorted? Is it going to be compressed a certain way? Um, and the, you know, it'll specify also again what algorithm you want to use to, to produce that result. So we're not always going to have a one-to-one -one mapping from a logical operator to a physical operator. Uh, like you could have a logical join, a logical order by could be combined together into a physical sort merge join. Um, but once you're in a physical form, you typically don't, like a physical operator form, you typically don't, don't convert that back to logical. That doesn't make sense. Um, and that sort of explodes the search space if you actually want to consider stuff like that. So it's, it's mostly logical to logical or logical to physical. And this I've, I've already said, but again, cost estimation is how we're going to use, what we're going to use internally to figure out what, whether one query plan is going to be better than another during our search process. Again, we'll, we'll talk about more about this next week, but basically it's going to be a combination of, of these different metrics, like uh, how much data I think I'm going to read from disk or read from, from, my, from my child operator, how much data I'm going to spit out, based on the selectivity or the cardinality of any operations I'm doing on that data as it comes in. Is the data skewed? Is it compressed? You know, where it's actually physically located? Right? All these things we have to consider uh, to have a true cost estimate. But it's never going to be exactly perfect. And the paper you guys read next week will, will, from the Germans will show you that once you do like two joins, then all these estimates get way out of whack. Uh, and the query optimizer, the cost model estimates are going to be woefully underestimating the amount of tuples that are coming out. And so that, that again, it'll lead it to, to choose an inco incorrect plan. So today, we're going to try to get through all five different approaches you could have. We'll see how, how far we can get. If we, if we, we don't get to randomize searches, it's fine, because nobody actually does this except for Postgres. 
And Postgres only does it if you have 13 tables in your join or in your table in your query. But we'll cover that next next class if we run out of time. The main two ones that we're going to focus on uh, are, are the middle three. So again, we're going to sort of walk through the in the order of complexity from like simplest to, to hardest, although stratified and unified are, are, are essentially equivalent. Um, and we're going to walk through like here's how people implement these these different uh, these query optimizers. What are the pros and cons of them? What can't they handle? Uh, and then how the sort of the next approach uh, as we go down tries to solve the, the problems of the previous one. And we'll we'll sprinkle in a discussion a little bit about how like again, real world systems do this. And the, the, but the TLDR is going to be stratified search and unified search are going to be the most common approaches. All right. So say you're a brand new startup. Uh, and you're, build, you're building a brand new database system from scratch. You're not like forking Postgres. You're just literally running, starting from nothing. Um, the heuristic-based optimizer is probably what most people, almost everyone builds first, right? Because it's super simple. It's a bunch of if-then-else clauses that look for patterns in the, uh, in the SQL query and then apply some transformation to convert them into uh, a better form. And the reason why this works is that it's based on domain knowledge about what we know as humans about query optimization and queries in general, and we're basically codifying that in our code to always apply those changes without worrying about whether they're the right thing to do or not. Yes? Mongodb still does it? As far as I, I have to double check, I don't think, I don't think they have a cost-based optimizer. Uh, the way MongoDB works is that they generate all the query plans, run them all, whatever one comes back first, that's what they pick. Because that's what it was a, a year or two ago. That's so it is, so you don't run like, like you generate all the query plans, uh, you pick one, you send that out first, see how long that takes. Next time the query shows up, pick the next one and run that. And then you just pick which one. You laugh, but it, it's pretty simple, it works. And then after like 20 iterations, they'll try again. Yes? The statement is, the MongoDB approach works if you assume the query is going to be very similar to each other, maybe just different input parameters. That yes, you could do that. And in the OHP world, or operational workloads that Mongo initially targeted, this works. Right? Because again, it's like, go look up Andy's record. Go, go look up Kyle's record. You just, it's the same query, just different input parameters. I, I don't want to get too bogged down on, on Mongo. Um, and again, I'm not knocking them. Uh, I'm just saying it's, it's cleverly simplistic. Right? They, there's other things to, 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 to bang on them about, like MMAP. Um, for this one, I, you know, when I was like, oh, yeah, I can see why you would do this. Because, again, what did I just say at the beginning? This is the hardest part of database systems. If you're trying to get a system up and running right away. Uh, they're getting huge growth. You know, they, they got that far without a query optimizer. Right, so, again, this heuristic-based stuff is going to be basic. It's going to be if-then-else statements that, like, look for patterns in the, in the query plan uh, and then applies some transformation to put it into a, a different form. So... The most obvious thing you can do is always do the most selective, uh, uh, most restrictive selection first, because you're just, just trying to filter things out as soon as possible. Because we know as humans, if you know, why spend time copying data from one upper to the next if I know I'm not going to need it? So let me go ahead and try to throw things out as soon as possible. All right? So that's predicate pushdown, limits, projections, and so forth. For join ordering. If you're lucky, they'll have rules that'll look at actually cardinality estimates and maybe say, oh, this one's bigger than the other one, and swap them. Uh, we'll see in the case of the oracles, their first implementation didn't do that. Um, so the two out of the three first relational database systems built in the 19, the major relational database systems built in the United States in the 1970s all did this. So Ingress did this uh, up until the mid 80s. Oracle did this up until the mid 90s. Um, but in the case of, of the, other, the other major one, System R, out of IBM Research, like they're actually going to do a cost-based search, uh, which we'll, we'll see next. Right? Again, most new database systems, unless you can reuse something like Calcite or Orca or an existing query optimizer like, like in Postgres, this is what pretty much everyone does. Um, and long-term, it's not sustainable. All right? The reason why I qualify is that the, the two out of three first relational database systems in the US because there was another one in Sweden called Mimer SQL, um, and there's a German one called Adabas, but I, I don't know what those guys actually did. So there are other relational devices at the time. Yes? Stonebreaker worked on Ingress, right? Stonebreaker built Ingress, yes. Why is it called Postgres? Because it's post-Ingress. Oh. Yeah. 
Right, Velda Ingress, it stands for something uh, interactive, graphical. It was some, they, they got a grant to build it for a, like a GIS application, and then they just started building it out to be more general purpose. Right. Yes? So about the last bullet point, I thought cardinality estimation was considered as part of the cost model. His statement is, aren't cardinality estimates considered part of the cost model? But in the, the difference is going to be, like, there isn't a search process where I'm, I'm enumerating over different plans to say, is this one better than this? It's literally like, if I have a join and the card down estimate is this one is greater than this one, flip them. That's literally all it is. All right, again, back in the day, data were small. There, it was, you know, you didn't have CTEs, you didn't have window functions, you didn't have all these other stuff we've been talking about. So this would get you pretty far. And for OTP, again, this will get you pretty, pretty far. So let's look at some basic optimizations that you can do with this. Um, so these, again, this is a refresher for, uh, from the intro class, but I'm going to show you these because this will be what the, some of the heuristic rules will look like when we look at the stratified search and the other stuff. Because again, this is, you can do this without a cost model, and for the, like a heuristic, pure heuristic, heuristic based approach, this will generate a plan you can then run, but the idea when we do have a cost based search, we want to use these, these transformations to guide us and push us towards what will at least be a starting point in our search for, for a reasonable plan. So we're, that we're not like blindly starting from the most stupidest query plan and then spending all our search time just getting us into a basic form that we, we could have gotten instantaneously using one of these rules. All right, so say we have a query like this, a three-way join on, on appears, artist, appears, and album, and we're going to look up all the people, all the artists that are on, the, on my mixtape, right? So the first thing you do is just split, split conjunctive predicates, so splitting any any filter on the AND clauses to break them up into separate filter operators, right? So you, you, again, you identify that I have, an, I have a filter operator within that exp the filter operator's expression. I have an ANDs. I spin on the ANDs and I create additional filter operators for that, right? Again, I don't need a cost model to do that. I know I always want to do that. So now, if I have these different filter operators, I can easily do now predicate push down to push the filter D below any join operator. Because again, why do a join when uh, on table or on data I know, I know I'm going to throw, throw away up above, right? So I just push all them down, I said to be right above the, the join in this case here. Um, but I guess they're, they're below this jo join up here. So these are the filters that are combining two, two tables. After I do the Cartesian product, then I do the join. Or sorry, then, then I apply the filter. Then the next step, obviously, we want to get rid of the Cartesian products. So we just convert the, uh, we recognize that we have an equality predicate right above us. So we can convert any Cartesian product into a, an inner join or an equa join. Okay, that's always going to be faster. And then depending on the system, I may also want to do projection pushdown. Again, whether or not I have a cost model that decides whether the size of the table uh, that I'm, or the data that I'm pushing up between one operator and the next is really big or not. But I guess recognize that rather than copying all the data that I know I'm not going to need, I'll just push down the projections to be below and any join operator. So I'm only passing along the minimum amount of data from one operator to the next. So all these, what are these four or five steps I showed right here, again, these are logical transformations that I can do without having to have a cost model. And I didn't specify what join algorithm I'm using or how I'm accessing these tables. I can just operate directly on, a, on, the, on the logical plan to do this. And again, we know this is always going to be faster than what I started out with, which is like, again, the canonical form of converting SQL into relational algebra. Yes. I think there are actually some edge cases where the, the predicate is really, really expensive and technically important. David, is, uh, there are some cases where if the predicate, the evaluation of the predicate is very expensive from a computational standpoint, then pushing down the, the predicate is a bad idea. Yes. But we don't, you're not there yet. You, you, you don't know that at this point here. Right? Because how do you weigh like, the number of tuples going in to, to, the, to the, the filter, all right, that's, that's a projection. Like, like, how do I know the n number of tuples coming in to, to, the, to, the, to the join is going to be, uh, say it's this one here. Say this comparison is super expensive. How do I know that the number of tuples going in would outweigh the, the cost of applying this for everyone versus above after the join? You don't know. You need a cost model. If you need a cost model, you need statistics. In the very beginning, they, they didn't have any of that. All right, so let me show what Ingress did back in the day. And again, this is like kind of the MongoDB one where I was saying, like, 
it's, uh, it's uh, delightfully stupid, meaning like you would never want to do this today, but given that the constraints that they had at the time and the hardware they were working with, without having a, a cost model and a query optimizer, is actually kind of clever. So the dirty secret about Ingress, at least the first version of it is, it actually couldn't do joins. Yes, first version of Ingress in like 1974-ish, three-ish, could, five. Couldn't do joins. Uh, they couldn't even do that. Okay. Well, yeah, old TV stuff back in the day. We'll see how they, but, like, but they, they want to support the query like this. The example they always have in the old papers is like employer, employee salary, like, like or department. Like they, yeah, they're all point lookups. Let's see, let's see how they do this. All right, so say we had the same query before. It's a three-way join on an artist appears at album, but now I want to throw in this order by clause for the artist ID. So the first thing they're going to do is they're, they're going to rewrite the SQL query into single value queries, meaning the second case of the first one here, I take the first query, I extract out and move out the, the, the lookup on an artist and appears, and I have a singular query looking up on the album based on the album name. But then I'm going to materialize the output into temp1, some, some table here. Now I can further decompose query two into two new queries, where the first one does a lookup on appears and in a, in a, you know, in a join with temp1, and the second one's going to do a lookup on artists and a join with temp2. And again, this one is materializing the output into temp2. Right? So now what I'm going to do is going to run the queries one by one, starting from the top to the bottom, and whatever, tuple, you know, whatever the result is, I then inject that into the next query I'm going to execute. Right? So if I run this first query, query one, look up the uh, album based on the name, it's going to produce album ID 999. So then I take that, map that into the rewritten query on the appears table, and substitute what would, would have been the join uh, clause on the artist table, or the, sorry, the album table, and now inject 9999. And then this thing produces a, a result, two results here, and then I'm just going to do a for loop on that and run each of those queries one by one. Yes? Is there a reason you skipped query two? Uh, going back here. No, query two got rewritten into, oh. so query two got re had a, th a three-way join, or two other two artists and peers, and that gets rewritten into three and four. Another question, yes? What's the definition of a single value query? Is it just one table? So that's, what is the definition of a single value query? Uh, to, like one tuple for one table. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, so like, well, in this case here, you would run it, well, it, it, it would be for, for one table. So you, you would get, this query would run once, you get two results. They, they could support multiple tuples in, in, in the output. And then now you take these two values, and then just expand that out into different instances of the same query. What do you mean one attribute? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean what, uh, one table queries, single table queries. So I'm showing this at the SQL level, but they did this all at the logical level, which is logical query plans. And then they would just sort of run this. And so why I say this is like stupidly clever is you're actually running the query optimizer every single time you, you, you generate one of these queries. So for whatever reason, if like for this artist ID equals one, two, three, if there was a, a better way to execute that than doing a look button four, five, six, you could actually support that because you would take this query plan, run it through the planner, and might choose a different execution path than this other one here. And because it's choosing on a per single value within you know, the lookup, what's the best thing to do? So it's sort of an early example of adaptive query optimization, which we'll see next week, but like, because you're running the optimizer on a per query basis, but obviously this would be super slow, you wouldn't actually want to do this, right? So again, I, I, it's a nice, uh, to me it's a nice historical curiosity. So. There is a big optimization. It's the easiest to implement and debug because, again, it's just a bunch of if then else's. This is what pretty much everyone does. And for simple queries, you're not going to get any faster than this because you don't maintain any state. You're not doing any lookup in the uh, uh, queries against the, the, the cost model, do estimations. It's like boom, 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 and then here's, here's the query and run it. Obviously, the downside is going to be this is going to be a nightmare to, ex to expand when you want to start doing more complicated things. It's going to rely on magic constants to say, like, you know, how much better really is something than another. Uh, if you had to start weighing in, like, the number of tools that this, this operator is going to spit out if you're flipping one versus another. Um, and then anytime you have, like, a nested query or anything like that, th th this becomes a train wreck, right? 
And most, most obviously, actually not even just nest squares, in terms of you have joins to figure out what's the right join ordering would be a, a total nightmare. But going back to this one here, the reason why we started with, uh, with query one on, on the album ID, because that's the only input we have to the query. So that, like, we know what the starting point is. But if it was just a join across the tables without any input, then you have to pick what is the starting point, which is the, you know, the first, first table you want to put, be part of the join. And then it all falls apart. So as I said, this is roughly what Ingress and Oracle did back in the day. System R, we'll see in the next few slides. They're going to have a cost-based search, for, at least for the, for the joins. Um, if you read the unofficial biography of Larry Ellison, uh, there's this nice little paragraph here somewhere where Sternberger talks about the Oracle's query optimizer. Again, this is about the mid-19... Well, this book came out in the 1990s, but he's talking about the, 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 sort of the, the race between Oracle and Ingress in the 1980s. And he talks about how uh, Ingress actually built a query optimizer that's going to look like IBM's, but Oracle was kept going on how you know, that was actually the wrong way to do it, and the right way to do it is what Oracle did, right? Uh, and that instead of calling it like a heuristic-based optimizer, they called it a semantic optimizer, because they couldn't do cost-based search so the, the, uh, to figure out the join order. So the join order was whatever the order that the, that the tables appeared in the actual SQL string. And they called that, an, or Larry Ellison would call that a semantic optimizer. All right. So good marketing. And then, like I said, IBM, or Oracle's going to rewrite theirs in the 1990s and make, make it uh, more state-of-the-art. All right, so the, at the same time, the Ingress and Oracle guys were building their heuristic-based optimizers. Uh, IBM Research, or IBM, was building System R. Um, and they ended up building the first cost-based query optimizer. Um, and the idea is that it's going to use a heuristic stage just like we saw it before, where you can do the logical, logical optimizations. But then they're going to do a plan enumeration uh, and, and transform physical operators. Uh, actually, that's backwards. It should be logical to physical, not physical to logical. Um, they would transfer, transform logical to physical operators and try to find one with the, the lowest cost. right? And obviously, to do, do this, you need a cost model. You need estimates of what, what each operator is going to spit out. Um, but the, the, and you can't guarantee that you're going to find the, the optimal plan. But there's things they do to try to at least get to a, a good plan, like only choosing left deep trees instead of bushy trees. If you're trying to cut down the search base. So this is what System R did in the very beginning. This is what IBM DB2, at least in the early 1980s, because that was the first commercial, commercialization of, uh, of a relational database at IBM. They did something based on this. And then most of the open source database systems are out today, Postgres, MySQL, SQLite. Uh, they're going to do something that looks, looks and not smells like this. So for this one, actually, I'll just skip. But basically, converting the, 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 the query plans, logic operators, and physical operators, like, to do this correctly, we need to understand like, what, the, what the, the table is going to look like, uh, what the inputs are going to be to this given operator, where the data is going to be located. All this is, is related to the cost model stuff that we, that we talked about before. And we'll talk about more next week. So to enumerate the plans, there's basically there's two categories. And this is going to be similar to the debate between do I want to partition my hash join or not? Like, you know, the, the people go back and forth on this. Um, but for query optimization, the, the, the question is going to be, do I want to enumerate plans and build things up, uh, the physical plan, from the bottom of, of the query plan to the top or from the top to the bottom? Or another way to think about this is, am I going to use a generative approach or a transform trans transformative approach? So a general approach would be I start with nothing. Like I have, I have no, no physical operators in my query plan. And then I'm going to iteratively assemble or in, in, in inject new physical operators to work myself up to the final output, the root of the query plan, that's going to produce the final result. And I can do cost-based selection as I go from, from one level to the next. So this is what System R is going to do. This is what Starburst, which is the, the, the query optimizer that IBM built later on in the 1980s, early 1990s. This is what they're going to do as well. Right? The alternative approach is to do a, a, the top-down transformation where I f start with the goal that I want, which is the root of the query plan. Like I want my final output of my query plan to look like this. Right? I'm joining these tables. It's sort of this way or wh whatever, whatever it is that that's what I want. And then I'm going to uh, permute it, the query plan going down and adding new operators that will then feed into my root to, to then produce the final result that I want. 
right? And it sort of seems like I'm just being, I'm making hand gestures and going, you know, going up and down like that. It doesn't make any sense. But it does have implications for the scope in which you can examine and, and operate on the query plan when you apply different kinds of transformations and how you're actually going to cost them. In the end, they're both kind of doing something that is, you know, that they're doing a dynamic programming approach. It's just the way and they're doing the costing and pruning things will, will, will differ. All right, so let's look at the system R optimizer. Let's see an early version of a bottom-up approach, and then we'll see how that thing gets expanded uh, into a little bit at Starburst. And as I said, next class we'll, we'll go to more details of the state-of-the-art approach of uh, bottoms-up plan enumeration that the Germans do in, in Hyper. And I think DuckDB does, does the same thing as well. So the way system R is going to work is that a query is going to show up, and they're going to break it up, the query plan, into to blocks that have logical operators for each block. Sort of think of like a block could be like a pipeline breaker, or it could be a nested subquery. It's going to be some subcomponent or subplan of the overall query plan. And then for the each logical operator within a subplan or block, they're going to generate the, the set of, of physical operators that could possibly implement it. Um, and they're primarily going to be focusing on journal access paths. So figuring out, you know, how can I scan this table, your index or sequential scan, uh, and then what sort algorithm, sorry, what join algorithm I'm going to want to use. And again, to, to reduce the complexity of the search base, they're only going to look at left deep trees. So they're not going to consider right deep or bushy trees. Again, this is a relic of the 1970s and a limited computing hardware, but a lot of systems still today make this big assumption. Right? As far as I know, left deep and right deep are, are always going to be equivalent, but sometimes you do actually want a bushy plan, and you know, they're not going to be able to find those. And so they're going to iteratively construct this left deep join tree, and they want to choose the one that's going to have the, the minimal cost at, at the end, ba again, based on some cost model estimate. So we go back to, to our query plan we had before. So in the first step, we're going to choose the best access paths for all the tables that we're going to, we're, going to, we're, going to, uh, we're touching in, in the query. So independently, we're going to decide, oh, we want to do a sequential scan on artists and appears. But then we, we identify that the, the, the best lookup for the album table will be on this, the index we have on name. All right, so all of those are occurring, occurring independently of, what the, of how we're actually going to do the join. Then we're going to enumerate all possible join orders for the tables. And this literally is just a Cartesian product with all possible com combinations or combinatorial uh, uh, combination of all the possible ways we could do a join, different join algorithms, different join orders, whether or not we even do a Cartesian product. The simple thing System R is going to do is, is sort of sh what I showed in the beginning is recognize that I'm almost never going to do a Cartesian product. So I, I can immediately throw, the, throw all those away. And then now I'm going to do this bottom up based search for all these different combinations that I have to figure out what the join order is that I want to be. So again, the, in this, this diagram here, think of the top as the final output, right? and the bottom here is my starting point. So my, my final output is what I want to have joined artist appears an album. But at the bottom here, I haven't joined anything. And assume also, too, I've selected you know, for each of these individual tables, as I showed in the previous slide, I've already selected what access method I'm going to use. So sequential scans for artist and appears, and then the index lookup on, on album. So again, so they're going to do a bottom approach. So starting here at the bottom, they're going to say, here's all the possible join combinations I could have for these three tables. And, and because it's PowerPoint and for simplicity, right, assume it goes all the way on the other side with all possible combinations. I'm truncating here in the sake of time. Right? And then now these physical operators then produce an output that's going to either have, that's going to choose one of the two tables to be joined together, and then the third table is just waiting to be joined after this, right? So I can do hash joins, merge joins, and, and so forth. And then now, for all these possible paths up to the, to the next level, uh, I'm going to choose for each of these next nodes, in, in a, you know, at the next level above, what's the, 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 what's the path that has the lowest cost, right? So for each of these, I'm going to choose one of them. As, as the best one based on my cost model estimates. And then now, I, again, proceed at the next level to do the exact same thing. For each of these, uh, these possible choices here, choose the different uh, jo physical join operators that then get me to my, my final result that I want. And then once I've done that, do the same thing. Choose along which one of these has the, has the, shortest, uh, the, the least cost. And then now, since I've reached the top of my, my, my query plan, I know this is the final result that I want. 
Now I, I just request back and figure out which of these is, is the, the cheapest path. And that's what I'm choosing as, as the optimal query plan for us. Yes? I don't know if you already uh, sort of answered this, but just to clear it up, um, in this example, we're going to just do an order. Mm -hmm. So is this, is this bottom up constructed as like, let's build each piece of the query plan? Does this only work happen for join ordering? Or is it going to do all this for like uh, different, well, I don't know if there's many choices for like a filter, right? but it's, is it going to try like filter here or filter here? Is it going to iteratively construct all the other components too? His question is like, when do other optimizations get applied like predicate push down here? It, for this approach in system R, they're only going to pick this in join ordering. In the case of, uh, in Hyper, we'll see next, next week, they're going to do DP just for join ordering. The way you would handle the additional things that you're talking about is that you would define those additional transformation rules in like a stratified search and you apply them potentially with, with the cost model as well and then you do this, this DP search. Cascades will integrate everything all at once. His question is, would you only want to do this bottom-up approach? Could you, would you only do this for join ordering? Yes. Because again, like, you're trying to like, march through. If I have to do to recognize blah, 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 I want to do predicate pushdown, you have to go back, insert it in somewhere, and then, and then go back up. It'd be kind of funky. Question. Question, are there special handling for aggregations? Uh, you'd have to, you would treat the aggregation as, as, as a block. So and then you could subdivide that further. Like basically one of the great boxes. Uh, think of this as, 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 a, as, a, as a query block. And so, yeah, in, in, that case, well, in this case, the aggregation would be the, if it's, if it's no nested query, the aggregation is the final output. So it would be a gray block above this, yes. Okay. Yes. And then the same thing, you could choose what aggregation algorithm I want to use, which is most, most always it's going to be hash join, or the, the hash aggregate. Yes? Um, you said you first select how do you access the tables. Would it be possible that um, for a different join ordering, different access method would be better? The statement is, uh, I said in the beginning, in this approach here, you first pick the access method you're going to use, uh, then you pick join ordering. Is it possible that for, there would be a different access method that would be better for a different join order, yes. Like if I'm doing, if I recognize that I have an index and I should be doing a nested loop join instead of a hash join, right? Uh, but if, I, so if I'm picking to always do an index join before I check my join order, yes, I would have a, I have a disconnect between the access method and the join order. For this approach, yes, that's a problem. The stratified search and unified search will, will fix that because they'll, they'll, they'll get everything all at once. So what's one problem with this query here? It's actually not correct, right? Because my original query said I wanted to join these three tables, but I also wanted to do an order by on the, the final output, right? And so in the original implementation of system R, this dynamic programming search piece had no notion of physical properties of data. So I'm choosing to do a hash join. Um, if I go back here, one of my choices could have been you know, a certain merge join. So maybe in the case where my, my, I would have been better off doing the sort merge join, because then my, 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 my data would have already been sorted. So the way IBM handles this, or System R handles this, is that they would keep track of the best plan they've seen uh, with and without a physical property, like, like the sort order. And then, they, so they would have that, they would have two plans at the end, and then they would say, okay, well, my data needs to be sorted, so, if I, if I have an estimate of what the sort cost is going to be, if I add that on to my unsorted data query plan, is that going to be less than the cost then of, of doing the sorting directly within the sort merge join? And if, and if, if, if still less, then you pick that one. So it's sort of like an afterthought. They had, to, they had to add this additional step to deal with physical properties of the data because they had no way to, to handle that natively in the search. Yes? Yes. Or you add an order by like a sort node above. This. Yes, correct, yes. Okay. So the statement is, what I'm talking about in this case here, because the query wants the data to be sorted by artist ID, if I, if I did a sort merge join uh, on, on artist ID here, 
then this, the output of this would have been sorted on, on the, in the way that the query wants. So you keep track of this query plan, and then because it says it's the best one of, of all the ones that are sorted. And then you keep track of the one that you pick that is not sorted. And then at the, at the end, you do this final step to say, OK, if I add an, or a sort operator on the unsorted hash join, is that going to be less than choosing the path of merge join? If yes, then I choose it. If no, then I, then I revert back to my merge join. Yes? So a simple downfall over here is that it's not looking at the entire query plan, just looking at the code. Is it same as the down? Did you say downfall? I mean, the reason it's bad. Here. It's not, again, it's not bad. The reason why this is uh, maybe insufficient for what we need is that they can't holistically look at all the all possible choices you could have for the actual query, right? In addition to the you know the heuristic st step that they had in the beginning, is it actually going to look a lot like the the thing we saw before with ingress and others? I mean, not not how ingress did joins, but like those logical transformations are going to be written as if and else clauses. The question is, uh, is it possible for these transformation rules to understand what the data's properties look like so that and account for that in its decisions? System R does not, the later ones will, right? Yes? So if you wanted to do heuristic rules, you would probably do it after building up the tree, right? Because otherwise you wouldn't have anything to transform. Your statement is, if you want to still do heuristic rules, you do this after this search thing? Yeah. No, you do this at the end. You do this at the end. Yes. You can go back and touch it up. Which Postgres does, right? After you do the search, then they go back and do some other additional optimizations potentially. Right, but then uh, you you would be sort of forced if you want to do things after uh, after the, the the join search, you needed to mix your physical and logical operators, right? Uh, because that it just generates physical operators. Yes. So if you want to do transformations on logical things, then you would need to. Do, yes, uh, logical tra transformations need to happen for this. And then, and then once you have a physical plan, you, you can do physical, additional physical tr transformations on it. Postgres does. If you ever look at the Postgres code, they do the join sort. They, do, they pick the join. They, they do a bunch of transformations at the beginning. Then they do the there's cost based join 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 ordering. Then they go back and touch it up and do additional additional physical optimizations. So the touch ups would be physical and physical transformations. Correct. The touch ups would be physical and physical. Yes. I see. Okay. So. As I said before, this is uh, an NP-complete problem. We could run this forever uh, and, and you know, may not ever you know, actually find the, the, the true physical plan. So we need a way to know when we, sh when we should stop. So we need a notion of search termination. And this will both arise in, you know, we need this for, for what I've shown so far in system R, but we'll need this in, in the stratified search and the uh, unified search with cascades. So the simplest thing to do is to do wall clock time. Uh, this is basically you know, what Postgres and other systems do. You can set basically a timeout of how long you want the query optimizer to actually run based on a physical wall clock time. You can set a cost threshold where you recognize that if I generate a, a, the first plan that I see has some kind of cost estimate, and then if I run for uh, a certain amount of time and I produce a plan that's maybe 10% better or some, some number like that, then I just say, all right, that's probably good enough, and, and, and you stop. Of course, now cause you, you still need the wall clock time because this thing could be unbounded because maybe you never find actually anything better. Um, so you still need to, to account for that and maybe cut things off, right? Um, the, you, know, the, the, you, you can try to be dynamic on this, right? If you can estimate the complexity of the query and say, OK, well, it's a 20-table join, so let me go ahead and like, give it you know, 10 seconds versus like a one, two-table join. Uh, you know, maybe give it you know half a second or something like that, but that's a really hard problem because you're essentially trying to predict how long a query is going to run before it actually you actually can know what the query plan is going to be. Uh, it is possible to to, to just recognize that if I, there's no more things for me to examine. Let me go ahead and stop. So you can do this on a sub plan or the, or in a group. We'll see in cascades. Like if I know that there's nothing ever, there's no other permutations I even consider for some sub plan. Let me just. Go ahead and stop, and, and don't keep don't keep uh, spinning the wheels trying trying additional things. The last one actually comes from Microsoft, which I think is actually really clever, and it seems and it's 
and it seems obvious after they sort of say it, um, where they found that instead of specifying any of these other, other metrics, like you know, the, the wall clock time, what you really care about is the number of transformations that you've actually considered. And that's what they use to just determine whether the, to stop or not. Because the idea is that some transformations may be cheap to apply, some may be, be expensive. So I want to know, like, I get a rough estimate of, like, the, of how long you think a transformation is going to take on average and the number of transformations I need to apply. And then you sort of calibrate that to see, okay, this is when I see most of the benefit for, for the queries that, that I'm showing, throwing into it. And then now that's independent of actually the hardware. So no matter whether someone's running on a cell phone or a really expensive, uh, you know, high-end server, to get the, the right query plan, it's, it's the number of transformations you apply rather than the wall clock time. Yes? When you say number of transformations, you just said that like, some are easier and some are harder to apply. Are they like, weighted so that like, it's like, not necessarily just a hard number? Weighted in terms of like the, oh, in, in, for like, the count? Yeah. Actually, I don't know. Um, I don't think they mentioned it. Who's they? Microsoft. In, in their talk. Yeah, yeah they, don't, they don't mention it. All right, so uh, the pros and cons of this, this actually works pretty well in practice. And as I said, most, of, most open source systems are going to use something right that, that looks a lot like, like this. And you can do additional rules, again, to filter out things like only looking at left deep joins to prune this, the, the, the search base to limit the scope of how long it, things are actually going to take. The downside is going to be like if you start throwing away things like bushy joins, then you may be just completely missing what the actual true optimal plan is going to be, right? Because you're making these decisions to, to print things out without considering uh, anything about cost. And as we said, in the case of system R case, you got to do extra steps to deal with the physical property. So the two approaches that I've, that I've shown so far, these are typically written in, embedded inside the database system as I was saying, as more or less if then else clauses. If my query plan looks like this, uh, then do this transformation. All right? And if you ever looked at the Postgres code, at least with the query optimizer and the, and the subplan sub -plan function, it is like I do these, check these things, and then I check these things, and then I check these things. And when you go look in them, there are more or less if then else clauses that are looking for queries of a certain pa pattern. But the challenge of that is that, of this approach is, it's really hard to write a query optimizer in, in this style of coding because it's, you're writing it in procedural code uh, and you're going to make mistakes. Or you're going to have to deal with a lot of uh, duplicate logic to identify patterns and so forth and then apply you know, certain rules and then check to see whether uh, the rule you just applied breaks some, some other assumption you have about the query plan. Right? So a better approach to do this, and what people figured out in the late 80s and what is used in state of systems today, is that instead of writing the code for here's actually the, the, the check I want to apply and then the, ch the change I want to make, you write the, the pattern in a high-level DSL uh, that's looking for queries of, of a, certain, uh, you know, a certain type with nodes operators of a certain type, and then the transformation rule ideally in a DSL, but not always the case because you can't do that. Um, and then you, you, you then have a optimizer, uh, or you have your system generate the code that does those pattern checks and transformations for you. It's very similar to the, to the JIT or CoGen stuff we talked about for queries. So in the late 80s, early 90s, there was this big movement on, on what are creating what are called optimizer generators, where again, the idea is that you declare in a high level language, here's the, the patterns I want to check for, and then here's tra transformations I want to apply when those patterns match. And now I can build these uh, I can then convert these into a, in a cogen, you know, cogen them into actual code uh, that I put inside my database system, and I only do this when I'm actually compiling the thing and not like, you know, on a per query basis. And then now I can then build the search strategy or the this, this, this search mechanism to then look for those patterns and apply them independently of the rules themselves. So somebody, someone, one team can go ahead and build the, the search engine, another team can go ahead and define the rules. And now even in a single location, I have all my rules defined, and I can easily extend them and expand them over time. So this is what we're going to see in all the, 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 the newer approaches, either doing stratified search and unified search. These are all be based on optimizer generators. Um, and the two big projects at the time that sort of led this, this idea was IBM Starburst, which is still used in DB2 today, 
and cask or the first version was Exodus, which was a precursor to the volcano, which was a precursor to Cascades. He ended up building, uh, the guy built three query optimizers. Cascades is, is the last one he ended up on, right? So again, the idea is again, you're cogenerating the query optimizers patterns based on some higher level language. So the two ways to approach this are going to be a stratified search and a unified search. And I've already started talking about this already. But like, the stratified search is that I'm going to do a bunch of transformations in the beginning based on heuristics, things where I know I always want to apply certain, certain, certain rules. And then I go ahead and do my cost-based search. The unified search is trying to do this all at once. And for, again, another way I think it's not exactly always going to be top-down versus bottom-up, right? But you can think cascades is unified search, and that's a top-down approach. Because everything's all in the mix, and you're just trying to figure things out. And then Starburst and others are going to be a stratified search, but they're primarily going to be using the bottoms up. But you could do this in a in sort of a, a stratified search. You could do a top-down search and stratified search. Like basically that's what Microsoft does. They have a bunch of rules that you know you always want to apply, uh, like predicate pushdown. And even though they're defined in the same DSL that you would use for the cost-based search. They sort of fire those at the very beginning, and only at the end uh, later on, then they do the unified search to, do, to clean things up further. Yes? What would a uh, Cal site be considering? Ca Cal site, I think they claim they're based on Volcano. Yeah. Uh, but they claim that, but I think it's, when we look at it, the lines get blurry. They claim they're Volcano, but it looks like Cascades when I look at it. Uh, and as far as I can tell, I think they're doing stratified, because they're doing a bunch of rules you always want to apply. And then they do a cost based search. But I might, I might be wrong. I haven't looked at the code in, in a long time. Yes? If you're applying with blue, but you always want to apply and then do cost-based, isn't that just stratified? Yes, yeah, so I'm saying the lines get blurred. So cascades is a unified approach. The way Microsoft implements cascades is a stratified plus, uh, so, you know, is the heuristics, then the search. Yes? So with the DSL, would you convert the logical plan into some like, DSL language as This question is, would you, would you convert the, sorry, with the, with the DSL, would you convert the logical plan into a? Something to, like, similar to what the DSL is, like, like, then you apply the rules and then you compile, or is it something No, the DSL would say, like, I want to find, I want, if, if I see these, some high level construct or uh, definition say, if I see these three operator nodes next to each other or in line, then apply this rule. So you're, you're not, like, you're defining what you want to see in the data structure of, of the query plan. And then the transformation rule, ideally, if you can write that into the DSL, but nobody actually does, that's usually, like, going to be C++ or something that's the, the same language that the, the, the system is written in. So the transformation rule still needs to be procedural? Uh, so the, the transformation you actually apply. Doesn't, doesn't, like, the original definition of all these optimized generators did not define it like that. In practice, everyone does. I think even in CockroachDB, I think they, they have it for the, the rules themselves. They have it in their DSL, but the, you can then escape that and fall back down to Go. Yes? So is the, is the, the difference between these two that in unified search, they're all written in the same DSL, and stratified search, they're defined separately? No. So the question is, is the key difference that the unified search and stratified search is that these are all written in the same DSL, and these are all written separately? Yeah. No. It's like, are you going to do, are you going to apply a bunch of transformation rules without a cost model? Or do you do everything all at once with a cost model? But SQL Server, you said, doesn't apply it without the cost model? I, they're using cascades. The cascades, that's what I'm saying. The lines are blurry. Let's not, I'm more concerned about top down versus bottom up. How about that? Okay. So, so again, stratified search, again, everything we've already talked about. You first do all the transformation rules on the logical on the logical plans, um, uh, and again, you, and you don't consider cost. And again, you, you basically, as, as the programmer, the system, you define here's the rules I always want want to consider. Now, your search engine could be clever and figure out like, okay, well, I I know the properties of of, of, of the query plan, and I would have enforcer rules in my in my uh, for, for enforcer rules that make sure the properties are being uh, or, or maintain when go from one plan to the next. You can have all that in the mix, but the idea again, we're doing these transformations without any kind of cost model, right? So it's not an exhaustive search. 
And then, then I do the call space search to figure out the logical plan, convert the logical plan to a physical plan. So Starburst was the first one that, that did something like this. And again, you see the basic two stage. There's the rewrite stage, where I'm just like before in system R, I'm, I'm breaking down the, this giant SQL query into blocks. Uh, in this case here, they're actually converting the query plan into relational, relational calculus, not relational algebra. Um, eh, that's, take that a little line. It's, it's, uh, it's like you know, existential qualifiers and things like that. It's, it's, it's less, it's less doesn't map e easily to executable code. It's more mathematical. I don't teach relational calculus anymore because unless you go work on query optimizers, which she's going to do, sorry, uh, like most people don't need this. Um, we used to teach it. We don't, we, just, we don't teach normal forms. There's a bunch of stuff like in the textbook we just don't teach. But basically, again, it's, a, it's more higher level uh, expressiveness for relational algebra in, in, in relational calculus. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if Cod invented it. It's from the 70s, though. All right. So they, they, they've converted this higher level form, do a bunch of these uh, rewrites, then they Gener uh, convert that back to a logical plan, or the, co the query graph model, they call it. And then you do a system R style, bottoms up dynamic programming uh, phase to figure out the joint order and additional optimizations. So this is what DB2 still even uses today. Um, and as far as I know, again, the, again, the lines get blurry, is, is CalCite technically doing stratified search? Yes, but I don't think anybody converts it to relational calculus other than IBM. Um, and so, uh, so in, for this exact implementation of, of like relational calculus into then to logical plans and then logical to physical and the step by step here, as far as I know, only DB2 does it. But the tricky thing is DB2 doesn't do this for all, sorry, IBM doesn't do this for all versions of DB2. So this you know, may not know this, there's actually different, four separate code bases of DB2, right? There's DB2 for ZOS, DB2 for the A, A900 thing from the 70s, and there's then there's one for Linux, Unix, and Windows, and there's a fourth one I'm forgetting, right? But they're all completely separate code bases. And the one that they, they built for, for Linux and Unix is actually derived from an earlier project called OS2 Database Manager. Who here has ever heard of OS2? One. It's the, it's the operating system that IBM built in the late 80s, early 90s to overtake Windows before Windows became huge, right? Because uh, IBM, IBM made the first like, personal PCs, but they made it over commodity hardware. Everybody started cloning them. So if you look at old magazines, they talk about like, you know, PCs being uh, IBM PC compatible or clone compatible, because they're just redoing similar things that IBM did. IBM wasn't making any money off of that, so they got, they got back into the operating system business for personal computers, made OS2, Windows killed them. Right? But anyway, so they had this database management system that they built for OS2 uh, that they named one of the port, renamed to, OS2, to, to DB2 and port this, but in this great blog article from James Hamilton, James Hamilton basically helped set up all of AWS's like, infrastructure and cloud computing stuff. Like, he's a big deal there. But he has this great blog article because he used to work on IBM uh, and actually SQL Server as well. But it talks about how in, in, in the early 1990s, they had this crappy implementation of a database system in OS2, but then they went to, to IBM Research and got the Starburst query optimizer and put that in. Right? So the, the links on, on, the, on the, the slides, it's a really good blog article. Yes? His question is, are the, what are the advantages to, to operating on relational calculus rather than logical operators? Uh, I don't know off offhand. Like, I'm sure there are. Yeah. It, may, it might be just a higher form that you then can apply additional optimizations on. I don't know. Um, again, outside of, uh, outside of Starburst, I don't, I don't, you don't across anything that's outside of theory. Uh, in, in, in data systems that operate in relational calculus. All right, in the sake of time, or we'll just skip this, but like the, the Starburst operator works ground practice, but in the, I don't think the paper you guys read talked about this, but in a lot of the follow-up papers from IBM, they talk about there are struggles of writing the, 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 the engineers struggle with writing the, the, the transformation rules in this, this DSL that IBM had. Again, I think part of it is because you're operating on relational calculus, which is unnatural. Again, we, we can cover that further if you want offline. All right, so the last 20 minutes, I'm going to try to cover uh, cascades. Um, let's see how far we can get with this, OK? So again, unified search is that logical, logical, and logical, physical are all within one giant stage. 
Um, of course, the challenge is going to be is that there going to be a lot of transformations that we're going to generate as we do this. And so we're going to try to we're going to use memoization as a way to, to keep track of what we've done in an efficient manner and try to reduce the amount of redundant work or redundant, redundant computation that we're doing. So let me show what Volcano does. Uh, we'll see, and then we'll see deficiencies of that, and then we'll jump into Cascades. So, so vol again, the key thing is there's a Volcano approach. The dude is legendary. So there's the Volcano project of the system defines the iterator model that we all know about, defines the exchange operator to do parallel computation, but then he's also got a state-of-the-art optimizer generator uh, that could be used for these things as well. As far as I know, nobody does this, although CalCite claims they do this, uh, that's based on this. Um, but this is one of the first approaches to doing a, 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 a top-down on uh, search to generate query plans. So again, in a top-down approach, you start with the top. You start with, like, this is the output I want. They're going to work down from the bottom and assemble the pieces you need to get back to that top. So the, you're basically going to invoke all these, these transformation rules that you have to, to in, generate new uh, physical nodes and logical nodes based on where you're at in the query plan. right? So here's all the things, you know, combinations I could have, just like before, leading down to the individual scans on each of the tables. So in the first step here, I could apply transformation rules to convert the, uh, the, the physical join, or sorry, the logical join an artist appears an album into a, a merge join on two of, the, two of the tables, and then have a third table just being uh, fed into it. Right? So then I traverse down here, and then I say, OK, well, for this physical operator, these are the logical operators that fed into me to get me to, to this result. So then I apply transformation rules to, the, to then generate the physical operators that then produce the result that I was fed into there. And as I'm going down, I'm estimating the cost, which I'm not showing here, of each of these physical operators uh, summing up the total back up to the root. And that tells me the cost to, you know, where I'm at, th at this branch in the search tree. Again, then I get down to here and say, well, what fed into get me to this? Uh, and then I could, I could, I'm not showing here, but I, you could pick then the access method for each individual tables. Go back up here, traverse down the other side. Here's the merge join for, for the other two tables. Produce this. Same thing I'm costing as, as I'm going along. right? And you just keep doing this and over and over uh, until you produce the final result. And again, because we care about what the, the, the sort order is for the table in, in the output, I have these additional fortunate rules that I'm defining to make sure that any data that's being fed into me from operators down below is putting the data in, in, the, in the, the physical property that I need or expect. So in this case here, because I, if I care about the, the data being sorted by artist ID, if I, ha if I then apply a transformation rule that generates a, a, a hash join, in this case here, that hash join cannot guarantee the data is sorted, so I can go ahead and just cut this off. And I know, don't need to do any further traversal down into to that branch. Likewise, if I say, OK, I have a quick sort operator, well, that, that'll get my data sorted that I, the way I want it. But then if I come down here, expand it out now to say, well, what was the physical operators, or operators feeding into me? If I then say, oh, I could do a hash join below, and now the cumulative cost of the quick sort plus the hash join is greater than maybe the, 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 the lowest path I've seen down to the bottom, then I know I don't need to expand this any further, and I can just cut off this, this branch right there. This is classic branch of bound search, nothing fancy here. All right, so let's jump to the cascades. So, the, the reason why I don't have you read the original Cascades paper is that it's actually not that great. Uh, have you guys read it? it it's, it's not like he keeps banging on how great his stuff is object-oriented, because that was the hot thing in the 90s, and, and Volcano and Exodus were not. Right? But you, can't, you can actually can't take this paper and actually implement it. Right? The best you could do is this thing from, it's a master's thesis from, from 1998 at a Portland state, where the first 30 pages tells you actually what Cascades is actually doing way better than the original paper is. So if you want to know what Cascades is, you could read, again, pages 1 to 31, uh, and I'll tell you how to do it in there. But this will begin to be a, a, a quick crash course on it. So the key, again, just like in Volcano, we're going to do a top-down approach, with backward chaining. But the key thing is that now we're going to support rewriting uh, through uh, these direct mapping functions that can iteratively generate the transformations, apply them to fan out the search tree, rather than doing them all at once. So I didn't show in the case of Volcano because it's PowerPoint, but like, every time I went down to another node, I immediately applied the transformation rule that generated all the possible combinations below me. And then I would iteratively look at them one by one. Of course, now that would be super expensive to do if, if a really complex query plan because now the search base is, is going to balloon and you're going to run out of memory. So the key idea they're going to 
do is that they're going to introduce placeholders to say, here's what the data should look like below me at this part of the tree, but I don't actually know what the right way to, 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 to execute it just yet is. So I'm just, I'm just going to have a placeholder for now. And then only when, when I care about going that further, then I, I can expand it out. But now I can expand it incrementally based on a priority that I can define to say, here's the things actually I should be looking at first. And you define that all within the constructs of the DSL that you're defining these rules. So the four key ideas. One is that the, all the optimization tasks are going to be, be uh, self-contained data structures. So know that analysis, think of these like structs or objects that say, here's the pattern I want to match in my query plan. And if you match, apply this rule. And the additional metadata to specify like what are the properties I need, I, I need to guarantee or, or that I'll generate from, my, from this transformation rule for this operator. And what priority do I want to give it? And this priority stuff becomes interesting because now, as I'm traversing down, I can dynamically change, although Microsoft doesn't do this, but in the original paper they talk about it, or at least the, the master's thesis, you can, as you look, go down and you recognize my query plan is looking a certain way, I can say, well, I want to apply these transformation rules because I think that's going to help me out better than just picking one, one at random. Right? And then the other key thing is that, although Microsoft doesn't do this, but CockroachDB does, is that when you think about doing optimization on the where clause, the expressions, the predicates inside the query plan, well, that's just another tree. And so you, within the same search engine or the, in the rules engine, you can do uh, optimizations for, for the where clause expressions in the same way you can do optimizations for the operator tree. Operator tree. Right, so simple things like I can identify oh, where, where 1 equals 2. You could have a rule that you then gets fired to say convert 1 equals 2 into false. Instead of having to do these, these optimizations, optimizations separately. All right, so, yes? Can you go over the second and the third one? Question, go to the second and the third one. So, this, so basically you define in, in the implementation of the, of the of like the, the, the optimization task, like a pattern plus a transformation rule, you define in that within it directly, here's the properties I, that I need you to enforce. Okay. And then the, the surgeon can recognize, OK, something feeding into me is going to violate that, so therefore I can't, I can't choose anything below that. Right? And the second one basically says, like, if I recognize as I'm going along, I'm trying to think, I have an example here. Um, yeah, I don't have an, I don't have an immediate example. Um, like, if I'm, if, as I'm traversing, I may want to consider some transformations more soon, or sooner than others. Like, for example, if I know my, uh, if my, my operator above me, say, is an index and a loop join, when I go down below, rather than looking at all possible transformations uh, from logical to physical, like choosing a sequential scan and then adding, adding a sort, uh, I may want to just choose the index probe first, because then that's, that gives me the data that, in the right order that I need going up. So is that also defined in the optimization? Yes, yes. This is what the, the priority? Yeah. It, it, it's generated on the fly. Well, so, so in the case of Microsoft, I think they just like hard coded it. So yeah, it's part of the, the task itself. Okay. In the original paper, which, I don't, which Cockroach DB, I think, I think they said they actually do. I actually, do. actually, I, I, I don't know whether anybody does this, but in theory, you could you could dynamically change this as you go along. So even though you may re you may revisit the same, um, you may come back to the to a same group later on, because uh, you did maybe evaluate everything. You, you could change the order you, you evaluate stuff. All right. So this part is being confusing because I use expressions typically mean like the predicates and a where clause, but in cascades, expression is going to be some, some operation within the query plan uh, that's going to do something, right? Or, you know, do some, some amount of computation in the query plan. So a logical expression could be, you know, three-way join on A, B, and C, where I join A and B in first, followed by uh, joining C. But then the physical expression could then be that I do a hash join on, on a sequential scan for this, a sequential scan for that, then I do an SLEP join on index probe on this. So it's defining, like, some set of of, I don't want to say operators, but tasks within our query plan that we want to then transform into physical operators, right? And so the key thing that we're going to exploit is obviously equivalency uh, rules 
in relational algebra because we would know that you know, we could switch the order of, of A join B to be B join A, and that'll still produce this, you know, the same correct result that we would want. Uh, and so we, we use that to define when we do our transformations, if we're permuting things a certain way, that we're not violating any of those uh, this commutativity properties or other, other properties that we care about in relational algebra. So then now we have the definition of a group, and that'll be for a given expression, it'll be all the, 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 the logical and physical expressions that are equivalent to some output that I, that I expect. So in this case here, I want to I want to produce the result of joining A, B, and C together, and my logical expressions within that group will be all the different permutations of of doing those joins, and then the physical expressions will be all the actual implementations of of that. So again, it's all the logical forms, and then all the physical forms that can be derived that from from these from these uh, logical forms. So the entire collection of these things is the group. In addition, with the properties that we, 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 would, we need to be enforced going into this, and then we have all, again, all the equivalent expressions for the logical and physical. And then now we're going to find a multi expression, which is sort of confusing, but that's basically meant to be as a placeholder to say, here's some expression that, I'm, that, I, that I have, but I don't know exactly the details of what's going on inside of it. And it's a placeholder to say, there's something below me in the search tree. So, for example, I want to join A, B, and C. So I could have, oops, sorry, I could have a a, a multi-expression to say, okay, there's a join in A and B together. I don't know what order and which way logically, and then I join with C. Or I could join B and C, and I don't define again what way I'm doing that. But it's just a placeholder to say something below me in the tree is going to be tell me how to do this. And the idea is that we're using these multi multi-expressions as a way to reduce the number of unique uh, operators that we have to look at. In, in, in this giant search tree. So the idea, again, because we're top down, we can make decisions by looking at this placeholder uh, at, at this point at some level in the tree without having to go all the way to the bottom. In the case of a bottom ups optimi optimizer, you're enumerating all the multi expressions one at a time and, and putting them together going up to the top. So in that case, they have, they have, been, they have not been materialized yet because you're starting from the bottom going to the top. In the case of the top down one, you assume sort of roughly that you have the path going down the bottom, even though you, you don't actually at, at this point. So this we've already talked about before, but like basically the transformation rules, logical, 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 physical. In, in the cascades parlance, they'll say a transformation rule is logical, logical, and implementation rule is be logical, physical. And then they'll have this pattern defines the structure of the logical expression that you want to you look for. And then you have a substitution to define the rule of, of, of the new structure you expect to see after you do this. Now, in some cases that you don't actually want to maintain the the previous history or the previous uh, the previous plan you, you've you've permitted or tra transformed the the plan into because you know it's something you always want to do. So, for example, like like converting uh, one equals two into false. I don't want to maintain that history of like oh yeah I did this transformation to convert one equals two to false because you never you never want to go back. And so there there are ways to 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 just always apply the, the change and then not keep, think, keep a history because you don't want to balloon, balloon up your history space. All right, so here's, here's, here's looking at a simple example of a rule. So my pattern is that I want to have two echo joins uh, with, a, with a right deep, right deep uh, join tree. So each of these nodes here are corresponding to groups because I'm not defining, at least at the, at the rule level, what actually is going on inside of this group. Right? This could be an index scan, it could be another join, it could be whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just some group. It's a placeholder. But we have to have a distinct echo join, at least a logical operator in this case here, that you know, I'm joining two tables together. So say this is, my, uh, this is my plan that matches this. So again, you see that I have my multi-expression at the top, join A and B, but I'm not defining how I actually want to do this. But then when you traverse down and below, it says I'm joining A and B. And below that, we have some get operators corresponding to the access method, the way you're actually retrieving this data. So this plan here, a logical plan, would, uh, would match to this, this rule. And I could have two types of transformations. I could have, I could have two types of permutations. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to use transformation because that, that's a specific type of rule. But I could do a transformation rule that converts me from a, a, rot from a left deep join to a right deep join, just rotating the tree so that the, the joins are coming down the right side. But again, this is, this is converting a logical operators to another set of logical operators. 
Or I could have an implementation rule that converts all the echo joins into then to be all sort merge joins or hash joins or whatever I want. Right? So again, these are the kind of this is what the patterns are going to look like. And then we would match on this, and then we can do these additional, uh, we can do these changes based on that. In this case here, you can see how like the well, in this case, we, we, we've joined with uh, A and B on the sort merge join. But again, in this one here, we have to still have the placeholder for the multi-expression, because that's feeding up, uh, feeding up into it. What's well, so one obvious problem with this, uh, say, we, this top one here? Because I'm going logical to logical. Say so I have another plan that does uh, right to left. What could it end up with? S well, same plan, infinite loop. You just keep flipping it back and forth. So this is where the memo table is going to help us out, because we can use that to keep track of, oh, I already have applied this transformation, because I know the cost of, of, of the query plan at this point, to avoid getting stuck in, the, in these infinite loops. So the memo table, at least in the original implementation or definition of the Columbia paper, talks about being a separate data structure, but you could actually embed this information into the groups themselves. Um, yeah, in the sake of time, this is too heavy to go into for like, the last three minutes. But let me show one example now, and then we'll come back to this. We'll, st we'll start next class uh, with this all over again. Which is, I, I, with all this build, I at least want to show you what it looks like. So say this is our query plan, what it'll look like. Again, the memo table, just keeping track of for any multi-expression, here's, uh, here's the best physical expression we've seen with a given cost. So in the very beginning, again, we start at the top. We want to have a join between A, B, and C. And we have no physical properties because we're not doing the order by for simplicity. So I could do a, uh, a logical transformation to convert the uh, transformation rule, apply it to my output to generate a multi-expression on A and B joined by, by C. So now I want to start costing this and decide whether, you know, is it worth pursuing uh, further inspection of this, of this multi-expression by traversing down to the query plan, say now my output would be a and join A and B. Well, I could join A. Yeah, the one way to do this is join A followed by join B. And the reason why A and B are multi-expressions is because I'm not defining how I'm actually getting this data. I'm not defining what the access method is. So to get further information about what this possible uh, subplan could look like, I have to go down, down to the tree now. And now in this case here, the only way to, to access A is to do a logical, logical operator called get A. That's not interesting. I can't cost that because it doesn't tell me how I'm going to do it. But I could then do implementation rules to transform this into either a sequential scan on A and then in, or an index scan on A. But then let's say for whatever reason, for this, for this data, whatever this query plan is, the, the sequential scan is, is faster. So now in my memo table, for the, for the multi-expression on looking up A, the sequential scan is the best physical operator I have for this, and then the cost is 10. I do the same thing. I, I bounce up back up here, do look on the other side of the join. Now I do a, a look at the B multi-expression. Same thing, I have a logical operator B, and I can transform that into a sequential scan on B, index scan on B. For whatever reason, the sequential scan is still faster, and then I update my, my memo, memo table here. So now, I bounce back up here, and now I just now have a transformation rule to go from, from you know, to swipping, swapping the order for B and A, and that's commutative, that's allowed to do. But now when I would do the same thing, I say I have this multi-expression on B and a multi-expression on A, I gotta go down to the groups below me and figure out what the cost of those things are. Well, I've already done that, right? Because I can go look up on my memo table, recognize that I know the best, uh, the best operator for B and the best operator for A based on what's up in here. So I actually don't even need to do that traversal because I have this information already. I just have to do look, do look up on the memo table. Right? So now, since I've exhausted all my logical expressions that, or transformations that I could do, then I start generating all the physical expressions. But again, I would do this incrementally. I'm showing this four, but again, you can think of like all possible com combinations of join ordering and all possible combinations of, of different join algorithm I want to use. So now, say for whatever reason, when I cost this, the hash join between A and B turns out to be the best, the fastest. So then the cost of this now multi-expression is just the cost of accessing A, the cost of accessing B, plus the cost of, of doing the hash join. Again, these are all just made up numbers. And so it's the summation of all of them, and now the cost is 80. So for the, for the multi-expression AB, the best physical plan is the hash join on, on, uh, on A and B, and the cost is 80. 
and now I bounce up the top and do the same thing down on the, on the other side and so forth. So this, this is what basically Cascades is doing. Again, the devil's in the details about how you actually apply these transformation rules. I'm not sure anything about priorities. I'm not sure anything about properties. But this is the high level. This is what the search looks like. And then I produce my final cost here. And then now if I do any other traversals for maybe other physical operators or other, other joins, I, I, I stop the search once I see a cost that's greater than, than 80. Or sorry, greater than 125. All right, so let's stop here. Uh, any quick questions? And we'll pick up this where we left off. What do you mean predict wrong? So the question is, which I mean, we'll talk about next week at activity stuff, like, what if my estimates are wrong? What happens? Most systems, nothing. You just keep going, right? We'll see ways to put hooks in the query plan to say, okay, if, if I'm getting, getting wrong, go back and replan things. We'll see cases like in IBM and other systems where you get feedback from like, hey, you told me it was this, but it's really this when I ran it again. So the next query comes along, you can get updated on this. But in general, like, all this memo state gets thrown away when the oh. query is done, which is why I, I don't want to do this in, in our optimizer. But then like, this thing is huge. Sh how long should that be maintained for? Right? Also, when I'm not showing in, in these multi-expressions, like, I'm not showing what the original query is, like, the sequential can cost of 10 for, on A, but what's the predicate? What's the where clause? That could be different for one more query than another. You'd have to account for that in your memo table as well. So that you potentially could reuse it across different, uh, you know, different queries. Okay, I'm always over ambitious of what I can try to cover uh, in the in the last class, um, or sorry, in this one lecture. So let me just say, we'll pick up next class on. Uh, we'll go through cascades again because we sort of rushed that. Um, then we'll talk about randomized search for uh, like in Postgres and others. Um, I debate whether I actually teach that because. No, like I said, nobody actually really uses it, and the Postgres one is broken. Um, last year, I put together this playlist on YouTube. These are all the, 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 the talks from the various companies over the years that have come talk to their query optimizers. The one I can, cannot recommend enough is the, is the one from Microsoft on SQL Server, because again, in my opinion, that's the, other than the way Hyper is going to do join ordering, uh, this, this is the best one, uh, and this is a really great talk. The next best one is probably from, from Becca from CockroachDB that talks about how she built their query optimizer, which is based on Cascades, and they do some of the things that um, Microsoft doesn't do. So, all right, next class will be finish up with Cascades, finish up with random alg algorithms. We'll see how Germans do an unnesting subqueries and how Germans do dynamic programming through hypergraphs for, for picking join ordering. Okay? All right, guys, see ya. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more a man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw my three in the freezer so I can chill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the pain I red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll run head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the silly cheese, so down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Pie.